Professor Dawkins, a the subject of evidence obviously includes all the evidence and not just part of the evidence. And so I read your book with interest to see uh, what you had to say with regard to the Christian God and you confessed that you were going to dismiss the Bible at a very early stage. What interested me was that you never addressed the central two arguments that the Bible uses for the existence of God. Uh, the primary argument which the scripture uses with regard to the existence of God is, maybe I'll preface, I'll preface it for the benefit of yourself and the scientists around. Newtonian physics can predict the future. It can tell us about billiard balls going here and there and everywhere. And wherefore we got a mechanical view of the universe, but we all now know uh, that quantum physics tells us it's very different from that and we cannot actually predict things at the uh, sub-molecular level. Therefore, we're talking about the difficulty of prediction. We can predict things pretty well, but not everything. That's the central argument that the Bible uses for the existence of God. And he brings forth this very concept, and contrary to all the other gods, that he predicts the future. And that is, the, the, you'll probably recognize this argument in another form, that is the prediction of prophecies. Prophecies being made many hundreds of years before being fulfilled. That is set forth as one of okay. the major. Could you comment on that? I must say I'm rather astonished that anybody could seriously offer biblical prophecy as no, evidence excuse, for anything. Excuse me, that's not the argument. The, the argument is... Predicting the future is something we cannot do. God says it's a prerogative that he can do. He has demonstrated this. Well, where has he demonstrated it? Well, that can be demonstrated for, by people who are familiar with scripture. That it's not very difficult. Well, go ahead. Right, I'll do that, if you'll, if you'll forgive me. Right? This is very, these are very familiar arguments to most Christians, and that's why I'm saying very, quite surprising you don't deal well, with Well, they it. may be familiar to most Christians, but they're, they're pretty well rubbished by biblical scholars who've, who've actually studied the texts. Well, for, for example, the alleged um, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies in the New Testament are all due to the fact that the writers of the New Testament knew the Old Testament prophecies very well and wrote the New Testament in order that they should look as though they'd been fulfilled. We're familiar with that argument, but yet you put a challenge forward. <laughs> the, the argument is very, very familiar to many, many Christians who can see. Can I, you've put a challenge forward. Let me try to be, let me try to do it briefly. You're, you're, familiar, you're conscious it's a bigger argument, but we'll need to do, try to be brief for yourself. Well, we do need to be brief, sir, certainly, yeah. yes. We, we, we can, from, scholars can tell us the text of the Old Testament was written before the Septuagint was translated, as you know, 300 years BC. Therefore, the prophecies in the Old Testament we know were written before that date. I mean, that is a, a, an undisputed fact. They were written before. Your question was, you know, that the New Testament text has been doctored to fit in with these prophecies. We don't need New Testament texts to prove the Old Testament prophecies being true. The early disciples never used a New Testament text. They used the Old Testament. They used the Testament that we've got in front of us, and we can use it. But right what now. are the prophecies? Right, I'll give you some examples. Just, just very briefly. Uh, one, uh, one, uh, maybe one. Uh, one, right. <laughs> Daniel 9, verse, Daniel chapter 9 tells us that when the Messiah was going to come, he would, be, he would be killed before the destruction of the temple. This one factor, when many, Christ, when many Jews actually address these factors, they say, well, you mean the Messiah was killed before the temple was destroyed? We know when the temple was destroyed. There is a prophecy, but one prophecy is maybe not enough. Well, we I'm afraid it's all we're going to have to, we're going to, have to no. settle for that. We'll just get a response from Professor Dawkins. But, to be, to be fair, the point is that... Well, no, sorry, sir, I'm going to just yes. ask for a response. It's just we do have quite a few people waiting and time is against us, so if you wouldn't mind. Sorry. When people allege that prophecies have been fulfilled, or indeed any kind of allegedly uncanny coincidence, they're usually a lot more uncanny than that particular one from Daniel, which could have meant absolutely anything as far as I can see. But even if Daniel had prophesied something really, really impressive, 
then one would still say it doesn't have to be that impressive because there are so many prophecies, which, or so many verses which could be taken to be prophecies and which don't come true. You only notice the ones that do. This particular one seemed to me to be about as unimpressive as one could imagine. But, the, um, but, the, um, the reason even it was a much more impressive was one than that. evidence about the dating of the prophecy there, we've got evidence with regard to its fulfilment, and that can be said about many prophecies. Well, sir, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just draw available with that one for the moment. I'm sorry, but it's just I do want to move on. Thank but thank you. you very much indeed for that. Thank you, Phil. Lady over here. I hear a lot of people using the phrase, when the universe began, and I don't understand what it was like before the universe began. Was it a complete vacuum? Was it born out of nothing? I don't understand what it was like before the universe began. Physicists will tell you, if you ask them that question, physicists will say that's an illegitimate question. I don't really understand why it's an illegitimate question. They say that the word before doesn't have any meaning before the Big Bang, because time itself began at the Big Bang. Therefore, there is no meaning to be attached to the word before. My puny little human brain isn't capable of grasping that and there are some physicists who will say that in any case you don't need to grasp it because that is only true of the local universe in which we live and they, force, they um, see, they visualize what they call a multiverse in which there are lots and lots of universes, each one occupying its own bubble. We are in just one bubble which was bubbled off from some other universe beforehand. So that's one way in which physicists can reconcile the problem of before the Big Bang. But that's a hypothesis, isn't it? That's not evidence, and your whole argument is about of, evidence. Of course it's not evidence. Um, it's it's um, one of the things that physicists are grappling with at the very frontier of what's possible for the human mind to grapple with. Um, it's possible that there are physicists here who can clarify it in a way that I can't because I'm a mere biologist. But I think this is one of the examples of an extremely exciting thing that physical science is, cosmological science, is indeed uh, grappling with at the moment. You'll forgive me if there are physicists here. Please keep in, stay in your seats. <laughs> we don't have time for that explanation. <laughs> Gentlemen over here. Good afternoon, Dr. Dawkins. Um, something that you touch upon in your book, The God Delusion, um, that I share a, a great concern with, is um, the factor of child abuse, that religion can be considered um, abusive towards children, particularly in its more extreme cases. Do you think there is much hope that as a civilization, as a society, whatever you want to call it, do you think we have much hope of being able to criticize religion to the extent where we can actually really do something about the abuse that does happen. For example, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, there are cases of children being stoned to death and burned at the stake because they're witches and so on and so forth. A lot of these things happen and not in the name of religion, surely? That's perhaps true. Do we have to differentiate between religion and the individual? Yes, we do, but these things are done specifically in the name of religion. That's the difference. Okay. That's all. Yes. Um I, I mean, it, it, it is very worrying. When children themselves are brought up to believe that faith is a virtue, to believe that you don't have to justify what you believe in, ter in terms of evidence, when you're told that uh, our tradition is that we do so and so, and you're discouraged from ever questioning it, it's extremely hard to break out of that loop. I would recommend reading Ayan Hersi Ali, uh, this wonderful woman from Somalia who was brought up a Muslim, was actually genitally mutilated in her girlhood uh, and escaped from Islam and is now an atheist living in, in, in America. Um, she's an example to everybody what can be done by an intelligent person to break away from the indoctrination that uh, many children, probably most children around the world, are inflicted with. Um, it's 
I don't really, I think the problem is a, is a political one. I, d I don't have a political so solution. Do you think there are any more people of faith who are bad, if I can put it that way, as opposed to people without faith who are bad? I think there are people who are bad, um, who are both with and, and without faith. If I could quote Steven Weinberg, the famous um, Nobel Prize winning physicist, he said, good people do good things and bad people do bad things, but for good people to do bad things, that takes religion. We've got this gentleman up here.